a guy in the southeast that did that. He said that when he put the cotter pin over the wire, he slipped, he slipped the cotter pin over the wire, and then he wrapped the cotter pin back around the wire one time, so it's, it's you know, it'll slide back and forth on the wire, mm -hmm. and it will come off. That way, when you pull the cotter pin out of the post, he said he got tired of losing those cotter pins, because when you just slip them over, the cotter pins would slip off the wire sometimes when you're moving the wire up and down, so he just wrap it around one time. That way, it's on that wire. You know, yeah. If you didn't hear that, he was just saying uh, he read about the guy who, you know, you have two sides to your cotter pin. If you uh, take and wrap one of them on your wire, and he just put one through the hole. He, he wrapped it all the way around, put both through the hole, and then just bend it at 90. You know, okay, he locked he, he, he locked it onto the wire by wrapping it, and then put both legs through the the hole, bent back 90. And that way, he never lost his cotter pins off of the fence wire. Wait, that that can make sense. Does that get to be more difficult beyond three or four wires, or can you only use it with? Oh, th this is usually done with just a, a single wire works the best. You can do it with two. Uh, if you try to do it with three wires, unless you have a lot of slack in your wire, yeah. it's awfully hard to get it up there. Okay. Yeah. Works, by, by far works the best with single wires. Yes? Okay, what, what's keeping the animals from rubbing these and knocking them over? Usually, they just dump. What I have seen some people do where they have had a problem is they'll run a uh, basically take a piece of poly wire to the side of this and after they lift it uh, either use a jumper lead to energize that poly wire or just you know kind of take the poly wire and flip it over the steel wire and then you've got a hot seam running down on that and cows basically aren't clever enough usually to figure out that it's just one spot on that pipe that's uh, that's hot, but I, I've seen that done. And then it, I guess um, I've never actually seen it, but in New Zealand, not New Zealand, Argentina, Uruguay, I've heard about uh, you know that they'll have a steel pipe, and uh, I'm not. I don't know if they have to shut the fence off to do this, but it's similar to when you take the pin out of your cotter pin and put the PVC over it. Uh, they'll slip that steel pipe over it. They have a, uh, a support low down on your fiberglass. They, they've done this with fiberglass because they don't have power flex down there, I guess. But done with a fiberglass post so that the steel pipe is six inches off the ground, but you drop that steel pipe. I bet maybe they put the steel pipe on and then use something insulated to lift the wire. And so there's that whole steel pipe coming down that's hot, and that keeps animals from touching it. If you, if you try it and animals bother it, you'll figure out some way to make them not bother it. That's ingenuity. It just we, we, we get the job done. Uh, but some other things about the lane. The only thing that I think ever should be in the lane is livestock. You want foot, you want an ATV, you want a horse. I never want to see a truck, a tractor, any kind of equipment in a lane. I advocate lack narrow lanes, and part of that I've been, you know, in New Zealand and seen 800 cow dairies that have eight foot wide lanes. Uh, cows don't move, you know, ten abreast usually when they're walking somewhere. They're strung out, and so an 800 cow herd can move easily through a 16 foot lane. Uh, when you keep lanes narrow, you don't waste as much space. If you're making a developed lane, like we typically would do in a dairy where we're protecting the soil surface, keeping them out of the mud, if you make it 8 foot wide rather than 24 foot wide, it's going to take a lot less, you know, cost to do it. Less equipment, less time spent grading, less geotextile, less aggregate cover. So I really advocate narrow lanes and never ever put equipment in them. Because what I've seen tear up lanes uh, creating roads on slope is truck and equipment traffic in it, not the livestock themselves. Now the livestock will start walking in your truck track after you've gone up the grade spinning your tire and made a spot, they'll start walking in that, but rarely do cattle in a developed lane ever actually create erosion themselves. Alright, so if we look at this uh, 
this deal. And these prices, you know, probably don't reflect today's prices. I updated this maybe two or three years ago. But the subdivision fencing on this particular design, there's eight, over 18,000 feet, worked out about $37 an acre on the stock water to run power from the line that was out here to the pond, 700 bucks. And again, as we've already said, that's going to depend on the uh, electric company you're working with. Figured $1,200 for the pump and pressure tank system. And then there's about $10,000 in water lines and tanks. So about 85 bucks an acre in the water development. Add those two together, and you know we're, we've got $120 per acre infrastructure cost in the stock water and fence system. Expense that out over you know several years. Look at it in the context of what else could you have done with that money over that time period. And it's still it, it's a real good investment. In a, on a per acre basis, annualized over 10 years, you're going to pay for that very very easily. Now. These fixed designs, advantages are on large installations, they're relatively low cost. That comes back to how much perimeter does it take to enclose an acre. The, on, on going around one acre, I think, what is it, 847 feet? Uh, going around 10 acres, it's a half a mile. So it, it takes three times as much fence to enclose 10 times as many acres. So when your individual paddocks are large, because it's a large operation, the cost per acre is quite low. If you build it right and have minimum maintenance, your daily labor is basically going and open the gate. And scare, scare, scare! You know, calling the cows, <coughs> they go through, boom, you close the gate. There's no real labor involved. Low maintenance, again emphasizing, buy high quality materials, build it right in the first place, it's going to be low maintenance. This uh, <coughs> figure here, we're looking at acres in a grazing unit, material cost to subdivide to 10 paddocks. And again, these aren't today's prices, we're just looking at the relative <coughs> the relationship here. If you take 10 acres, split it up into 10 one acre pastures with permanent fence, it was up over $70 an acre to do that. Go out here, and is Neil Dennis here? We can talk about sections. Yeah. So if you take a section, 640 acres, and split it into 10 64-acre paddocks, the cost was only six or seven dollars an acre because it takes not so much fence to close an acre when you're enclosing a bunch of acres together. So big units are cheap to fence, small units are expensive to fence. This is a similar one for stock water. We have number of cows in the herd, annualized development cost. Uh, small herds are expensive, big herds are cheap. So disadvantages of a fixed system is on a smaller operation, more typical of the Midwest, it's pretty high cost per acre if you get to putting too much fence in. And then you have this limited management flexibility. You know, picture those small odd-shaped pastures and God forbid that circumstances come up that you actually have to hay this area rather than grazing it. But sometimes things like that happen. Like if you're, you're all set up for custom grazing, custom stockers, you've been doing that for a few years, and you're supposed to get cattle delivered on April 15th, and the time's getting closer and you haven't heard from the, the cattle broker. And finally, on the morning of the 15th, he calls you and says, you know these steers are just way too high this year. I can't buy any. I'm not going to send cattle to you this year. And you've been planning all winter that that's how you're going to use this unit. You're going to run stockers on it. Uh, you scramble around, try to find something else, but everybody's on the same boat. You can't get cattle. The grass is up this tall. You know, by the first of June, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'll go out and bail it for hay. Hey, I've been there, done that. Doing three acre paddocks, cutting them for hay, odd shaped fields, and it's no fun. It's very inefficient. So, you learn that you don't want to get yourself in that position. But what other option did the guy have in that deal? So that brings us to flexible designs. And we're going to take the same 140 acres, but take a completely different approach on it. What we basically do in a flexible design is create what I call grazing corridors. And those are just long, narrow, relatively narrow strips that we can easily further subdivide with temporary fencing. 
We like to make those, par those as near to parallel as possible. Some of them we're not going to just because of the shape of the land and the landscape. I like to keep these fences uh, less than a thousand feet apart. Ideally, I like them 500, 600, 700 feet, something like that because it doesn't take very long to run the temporary fence at those distances. So that's kind of the criteria we're looking at. In this example, to put in the permanent fence that we need, including going around the pond, but creating corridors, rather than having 18,000 feet of permanent fence, we only have 6,800, rather than costing, we're 35, 36 bucks an acre, we're 12, 13 dollars an acre. So we have a lot less cost in our permanent fence. For our stock water, and to illustrate the difference, I'm not burying any of this line, I'm just doing an over the surface line, movable tank. The power and the pump is going to cost me the same, but rather than having $10,000 in water tanks and pipelines, I only have $3,000. <coughs> uh, and again, just the, the black poly, the HDPE, and make sure everybody recognizes there is a difference in types of black gold pipe. You have LDPE, low density polyethylene. If that freezes, it splits. HDPE, which is what begin with power flex cells here, high density polyethylene. Water, when it freezes, expands to, has a maximum expansion of 8% of its volume. The HDPE pipe, the plastic polymer, is designed to, I believe it's 14%, to expand 14% of its capacity. So if you have water free solid in it, the pipe still does not stretch beyond its capacity to expand. And that's why you can use this over the surface HDPE pipe, have it freeze up solid in the winter and not grow. So, uh, and then we need the temporary fencing. And I figure, you know, for each herd of animals, you need three sets of temporary fence. Two that are uh, containing the animals, one set up for your next move. Daily chores, the animals move to this strip. You take down the back fence set it up as the, the next break. So each herd, we need to have three units of temporary fence. And to me, a unit of temporary fence is a standard three to one geared reel. Used to be O'Brien. Uh, now the PowerFlex is their replacement reels with the quarter mile of braided poly wire on it and then about 20 of these step-in posts. Uh, with 20 of these posts, you can span a full quarter mile if you're putting them at 60 to 70 foot post spacing, which is about what we are normally doing in our summer grazing. We'll be putting a post out every 60 to 70 feet. In the winter time, we go even further apart with them just so we don't have to put as many posts in the frozen ground. If we add up all of those, we got $13.36, makes $49, about 52 bucks. In our grazing cell investment now, rather than having $120 and limited management flexibility for 50 bucks, we've created not a 16 paddock system, an infinite number of paddock systems. We can give them an entire corridor if we want. We can increment it, allocate it out in one acre increments if we want. This is anything from a basically a three or four paddock system to a 200 paddock system. What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? So that's a, a flexible system and that's what we mostly do these days is flexible systems. Jim? Yeah. On, on the watering system, you mentioned earlier the, the merits of having the cattle have access all around the tank. In these temporary tanks, uh, how do you keep the water, the cattle from kicking the belt, kicking the the end of okay. pipe loose from your portable tank. All right, good question. On these portable tanks, how do you keep the cattle from, you know, knocking your hose off, tearing off the, uh, the pipeline, tipping them over, do whatever. Uh, in temporary systems like this, we don't try to let the animals get all around. We're relying on a high recharge rate, the animals being very close to water, that they come in, get a drink, go away. And so we're usually setting that tank uh, at the electric fence with the inlet hose on the opposite side from where the animals are or directly under um, the wire. There's also combination systems. 
where like on, on our pivots, what we do, we have permanent 